have Dr. Malika Sarabhai. She's a dancer, she's a choreographer, she's an actress, writer, and most importantly, I think she's a social activist who has really uh, made sure that through dance and various other forms of art, a message is sent across. Thank you so much, Dr. Malika, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. You know, the first thing, I mean, the amount of work which you've done and you know, the messaging which you've uh, you know, put across through dance, we're gonna be talking about that. But tell me, we know, do know, Malika, that art is a common language that connects us all. And you have experimented with, with all, whether it's dance, theater, music. W what, according to you, is the best thing about art as a medium to connect people? You know, if you look at uh, India or any of the other ancient cultures, art was never a thing apart from living. It was... Mm -hmm. It was a reflection of life. It was a reflection of what you were going through. It was a reflection of the work you did. It was a reflection of the life passages of marriage and birth and death. And it's only, I think, in the last 250, 300 years that we see it as entertainment. And that's what communicates because it's from the heart. It's, uh, it reflects personal experience, mm -hmm. but it also plugs into the experience of humanity. And I think that's why it goes beyond language. Uh, Dr. Malika, you know, you have been a strong advocate for women's empowerment. You've been doing some credible work for decades now, and you use a lot of mythology. Tell us about the use of art to bring about social change. I mean, how does it, uh, you know, affect and bring that strong messaging? You know, the Hindus of this country have lived with our myths in a very day-to-day -day way. Mm -hmm. Today, it might be different, but certainly when I was growing up and when my children were growing up, if there was a fat and very strong boy in class, they would say, Dekho, bheem jaisa hai. Uh, or, you know, references like that. So yeah. it's not like we had to go to a temple mm -hmm. and, and go into the myths. The myths are all around us, whether it was in Bollywood versions or anything. And, Look at Hinduism, look at the way gods were addressed. It's Sita Ram, it's not Ram Sita. It's Radha Kishan, Radha's Krishna. It's Lakshmi Kanta, Lakshmi's husband. So where did this association of a man as a woman's person get mm -hmm. tilted by patriarchy? And where did the women get reduced to these black and white convenient mm -hmm. figures that you could oppress other women in current times. I thought I really need to come out and use mythology mm. to peel away the patriarchy. Again, just, you know, I want to ask you, we are going to be talking a lot about dance and, you know, what Darpana does. I want to ask you something which we want to focus on is self-care, especially for women. How important is it? And when women mostly take charge of the house, they prioritize their family, kids, husband, their own work. How important is self-care, especially when we're talking about physical well-being, mental health, and what larger impact does it have, especially not only on her, but also people around her? I start off by telling you an experiment that I've been doing in Darpana over the last 10, 12 years, which is that I would come back from my office across the street to Darpana, mm -hmm. and I would see all these mothers sitting outside with their daughters inside or their sons inside. And one day I just stopped and I said, how many of you want to learn how to dance? And they'd say, oh, Ben, it's too late, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, too late for what? And then they came out and said, oh, you know, I always wanted to learn and I never did. My parents wouldn't allow it or I got married very early. So I said, come, come and learn because I want you to have the joy yeah. of having something for yourself. Mm -hmm. As women who find themselves at the age of 40, 50, 60, we've just had three graduates over 60, and their families are transformed because they come and say, the husband says, I didn't know this was my wife. Yeah. I am seeing a completely new person. And we have children, grown up children calling from Australia and America saying, just make sure that our mother doesn't give up because, because we will pay for it. We will come and we will, because she's somebody completely different. Wow. And the way the women blossom, it, it brings tears to my eyes just to talk about it. And that's the importance of self-care. Women spend all their lives in this stupid society of ours being asked to be dutiful and sacrificial yeah. we are not the sacrificial lamb and the more we are 
happy within ourselves, mm -hmm. the more joy and care we give others. Otherwise, it becomes a duty. Otherwise, we are doing it with gritted teeth. Be daring. Try it. Look after yourself. It's not selfishness. Yeah. Because we I mean, have that guilt. It. Somewhere, Malika, Absolutely. that guilt, you know, that oh, I'm taking out that one hour for Absolutely. myself. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, oh, you have the time to go for a facial, really? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing that's, and yet, it's fulfillment and a sense of feeling well and well-being that spreads joy in the family and to everybody around us. Not a feeling of being tired all the time or yeah. being yelled at by the husband or being exploited by the children. Absolutely. I think it's crucial. I think you've just hit the, I mean, you hit the nail. It's absolutely, I think if you're happy, you can spread that happiness. Yes. That. It's yeah. so important to take out that little me time. I mean, you know, just to relax and do what you want to do. So I mean, you experimented it, you saw it with the, you know, the ladies, which it's you started amazing. to dance after years. I mean, that, that's just amazing. You know, also, Malika, you've been working on gender equality, female infanticide, sexual violence for decades. You know, we've all started talking about, about it now more because we realize it, we see it a lot more. Tell us about the shift you're seeing related to violence against women when I talk about today. I think there's much more violence against women today because the general levels of the violence we see, mm -hmm. the violence we condone, the gender and caste violence mix that affects women, mm -hmm. and, the, and the many Me Too crimes that happen. So you don't only rape, but you rape and kill. There is much more abusive language. Mm -hmm. The internet is full of abuses and abuses and and women in public life or women in in the media get it all the time so there's much more because there are many more forms of violence there are many more platforms for violence mm -hmm. also there is very little shame what has changed is that women are more willing to talk about it women are more willing to discuss it and there are more fora available today to mm -hmm. actually say i am not a victim i want to be a survivor yeah, rape is not because something I did, it was a violence done on me, it was an invasion of my privacy mm -hmm. and I demand justice. I think that is the shift. The shift that actually needs to be done is to work on men so that they don't feel threatened and they do not take women first as women and much later as human beings. So mm -hmm. we as women who have had children or who are about to have children need to make the shift into not thinking in girl boy terms or Hindu Muslim yeah. terms yeah. or any of those binaries, but to try mm -hmm. and make our children into more humane beings. I think yeah. then the shift will happen. Yeah. The general levels of violence of all forms of violence are much heavier today. Yeah, and I think the shift needs to, it needs to start early and it needs to start early, with a boy, girl. Early. And you're right, I mean, the men, the boys need to be taught from an early age, sensitization needs to happen. That is okay oh. to cry. It's okay not to be sturdy and the he man, mm. you know, mard bano are probably the most dangerous words yeah. in any language. So breaking the stereotypes again, like when we see women today doing stuff out there, you know, what we always thought men would do. I think that that those same similar for the men as well. I think, like you said, you know, just another thing, since we're talking about women, the taboos, we were talking about teaching men, when we again talk about gender, uh, gender bias, violence against women, when we look at women's health, especially menstruation, or even for that matter, menopause, these things are never spoken about. And menstruation is still a taboo, like in some parts of a country, it's celebrated when a woman gets her, you know, period, but whereas in some, she's just um, ostracized in the sense, what do you th think, like, why does it still exi exist in our parts of the country? You know, a woman menstruating is mm -hmm. the most powerful symbol mm -hmm. of a race going on. If a woman doesn't menstruate, that race will die. If a woman menstruates, that woman can give birth and therefore the human race or the tiger race continues. Mm -hmm. And that is a very frightening aspect to men. And that is why if you see all the things that are attached to being feminine mm -hmm. are made out to be weak or dirty menstruation is dirty and yet if women didn't menstruate mm. no humanity true we need to break these myths open also that the woman's menstruating blood mm. has more stem cells than any other blood and can save more lives which is why a lot of europe is not using pads anymore they're using menstrual cups and in countries like sweden i believe there are hospital trucks that go around collecting this 
uh, blood so that stem cells can be retrieved from it and given to patients of cancer and people to save them. Yes. There is no blood that is heavier with stem cells. If we start educating people about this, hmm. if we start saying that this is not dirty and that women were asked to rest because they were renewing their, their, mm -hmm. their internal cells that would later make them become mothers and mm -hmm. that it was not saying, oh, you are dirty, therefore you cannot touch yeah. anything, oh, you are dirty. Well, if menstruation is dirty, then the human race is dirty. Yeah. In fact, you. I was reading something some, very interesting. You written the menstruation is dirty, then the whole human race is dirty because without menstruation there would be no pregnancy. It really makes you think. So Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. I mean, I'm considering we're in the 21st century. Okay, talking Malika about darpana. Tell us what is darpana doing when we talk about uh, gender sensitization? Because you have been doing a lot of work. Everything from language mm -hmm. to the color coding of so-called educators. In fact lead you straight into the same silo of this is what girls do and this is what boys do. Mm -hmm. And in Darpana, we have actually gone and sat in classrooms of schools which consider themselves very enlightened mm -hmm. and videoed behavior where the teacher doesn't even realize she's being gendered, mm -hmm. where the books are all properly done, but girls are still in pink and boys are still in blue. Mm -hmm. And the great Indians on the walls a 99% male yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we have been doing quite a lot of research and seeing how our programming can break those particular things in children who are very young, because mm -hmm. again, research shows that three-year-olds do not see a difference in gender. By the time they are five, they're already seeing gender differences so that a boy gets labeled strong and a girl gets labeled beautiful. Hmm. So you need to start younger and younger because younger and younger our children are prone to be looking at social media, which is hugely gendered. Exactly. I mean, I think it's just from the beginning, you know, like you girls, boys can't cry or girls are beautiful. I mean, the way you said it, I mean, these are things actually and the change can happen. It's just about. Oh, yes. Thinking. Oh, yes. I mean, it's a question you know, of messaging. It's a messaging, question of yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, Malika, mostly people view, when we talk about dance coming back as a you know, form of art, mostly people view art as a form of entertainment, a hobby. How do you think we can use it in the same way as we use STEM fields to bring about a change? Darpana has done a lot of work in using the arts to talk about things as different as mm -hmm. how to handle diabetes, to why a girl child must have an education, to gender-based violence, to environmental destruction, uh, and to many of these. And we have tried every form of the arts. We, we don't go in saying, I am a dancer, therefore we will use dance for this. We see what is the messaging and who are the people that need that messaging and what is it that will go. You know, talking about COVID-19, the pandemic has impacted each one of us in different ways. I mean, in fact, every aspect of life. What about the art industry and how, what more could be done so that it bounces back post the pandemic? It was pretty difficult before the pandemic as well, not for not for the visible people like me. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you talk of a dance performance, mm -hmm. you are not thinking of the metal smith who made the gungurus, who will go out of a job and will starve because the gungurus are no longer in demand. You are not thinking of the weaver who is weaving Kanjivaram saris and her loom is going to shut down. You are not thinking of the leather maker who no longer has a demand for the mridangams and the talabadya kacheri instruments. We are only th thinking of the person who comes in front of the audience. There are hundreds of things that lead up and that whole industry is in dire straits. India has never had a consistent policy to support the arts. And there are all these amazing groups lying in far-flung places who are doing bhavai, who are doing yatra, who are doing yakshagana in some village, mm. who have no support at all. And where are the patrons? The, the, new, the new karorpatis are not patrons. Uh, mm. The government is not a patron. The temples are no longer patrons. There are no rajas. Mm -hmm. So who is supporting the arts? COVID made it much worse, but the arts were in pretty bad state even then. And I think like you rightly said, it's not just the artists. In terms of impact, Malika, how did you see your own choreographies around social issues affecting your audience as well as your students from your academy? 
somebody was asking me the other day what we teach in darpana and i said through the arts we teach human beings to be humane beings we teach them their roots and we teach them that the branches can go anywhere they want i think the very fact that i am still being asked by colleges schools younger audiences to go and perform to talk to them mm. means that there is a possibility that my kind of work is having an impact thank you so much for giving us a time